Hello everybody and thank you for joining me for the online sermon here at St Jude's. I'm looking forward to seeing everyone here, uh, well today is Saturday as I record the sermon. I'm looking forward to seeing everyone here tomorrow for Dedication Sunday for our special 10.30am combined service and lunch, uh, which is a day that we celebrate the dedication of this church. Well I'm going to start uh, by reading the Bible passage for this week which is Luke chapter 9 beginning at verse 18. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked, Who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendour, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfilment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving, Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. Well, what a good day it is, Dedication Sunday, a Sunday to mark the 157th anniversary of our building and 165 years since the parish of Randwick began. It's actually the first time we've held Dedication Sunday in person since 2019 and since I was away that year I haven't experienced it in person since 2018. There you go. Well it's a time to look back with thankfulness, thinking of the people that we remember who have made such contributions to this place and to the people of God here. And also, I think we can look back with a certain amount of wonder just to think of all the people who've worshipped here that, that we don't know. To think that in 1895, for example, uh, there were people who would gather here each Sunday to offer their prayers and praises to God, to the very same God that we address today. God remembers 1895 easily and, of course, knows all of those people. But there is a certain amount of wonder in in that thought for us, isn't there? Not only that, but it's a time to look forward in hope to what God will keep doing here. Uh, Both the the Revelation reading that that we'll be reading on Sunday uh, from Revelation chapter 9 and also Psalm 78 shed light on this. The reading from Revelation takes us forward to the end of time when God will have gathered together everyone who has believed in Jesus 
it'll be a multitude that no one can number. It is a certainty that God's purpose for history culminates in that great multitude from every nation gathered to praise God. God's purposes haven't changed and they won't change until the end of time. And that means that our task hasn't changed either. Uh, in, in that respect, we're no different from the ancient people of God in Psalm 78. Uh, they knew that they had a precious deposit in the words of God which had been passed down to them. Things that we have heard and known, it says in Psalm 78 verse 3, that our fathers have told us. And so, as the people said this psalm together 3,000 years ago, they pledged themselves. Verse 4, We will not hide them from our children, but tell them to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and His might, the wonders that He has done. See, that's the task, to tell the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord. And so I thought today, let's just remind ourselves of those glorious deeds and the person who is at the centre of them all, the church's one foundation, Jesus Christ our Lord. The Gospel reading from Luke 9, which I read just a few moments ago, it picks up a conversation of Jesus and his disciples. They were alone, they were away from the crowds. It was a chance for a good conversation without interruptions. And so Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Now, I think it's a really clever question that Jesus asked. Here he is, he's in quiet conversation, they're away from the crowds, and he taps into what the disciples will have heard as they have moved among the crowds. Well, what are they saying about me out there on the street? Jesus asks his disciples. And the disciples' answer is in verse 19, Luke chapter 9, verse 19. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets from long ago has come back to life. Well, you have it there, people in Jesus' own day, and these, of course, are the Jewish people in, in whom Jesus mostly mixed. They were saying that Jesus was some sort of a prophet, maybe John the Baptist, maybe Elijah, or one of the others. Now, I want to make an observation about that, and I hope you'll find this interesting. The people on the street in Jesus' day, as they tried to understand who Jesus was, they were thinking in categories that they already knew. They'd already heard of prophets, and so they were thinking that Jesus was a prophet. Uh, he, he was an amazing person, certainly, but, but they thought of Jesus as another example of something that they'd had before. We've had prophets before, we'll probably have prophets again, and, and here in Jesus they thought, well, we, we have a prophet. Now, I think that Jesus' question, who do people say that I am, I it's actually still a very engaging and a relevant question, isn't it? You could ask people these days, who would you say that Jesus is? Now, what if you took a poll of the people walking down the streets of Randwick? Who would they say that Jesus is? Well, many, of course, would give a Christian answer, and that's great. But many will be just like the people in Jesus' day. They'll think in categories that they already know. They will think of Jesus as just another example of something we've had before and since. A revolutionary, as some people used to think, perhaps it's a bit of a dated view now, back in the 80s and maybe even more, back in the 60s, people thought of Jesus, oh yes, he, he was another revolutionary, like Robespierre or, or Che Guevara. I'm not sure how many people think that way these days, perhaps there are still a few. To be honest, although it pains me to say this, I think there are many people in the younger generation who just see Jesus as a as a random guy. You know, they, they've, heard, they've heard of him, but they, they know so little of him that to them he's, he's just a random guy. And of course, random guys, we've had them before, we'll have them again, and none of them are relevant to us. Still though, I think the biggest category which people put Jesus into is that he was a good moral teacher. 
It's still the big one. This is the way that people view Jesus. Uh, and, and because Jesus is most famous for his compassion, uh, he resonates us uh, with us today in an era when compassion is, is possibly the only moral principle that everyone believes in. But whether it's as a prophet, as, as Jesus' own contemporaries thought, or as a revolutionary, or as a random guy, or as a moral teacher, we tend to think in categories we already know, don't we? So you see, unless you really understand, you'll think of Jesus as another example of something we've had before and since. But Jesus' question who do people say that I am? It's really just a warm up. What Jesus wanted to do was get his disciples into the zone for the real question. And the real question is verse 20. He turned to his disciples and he said, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? That's the question that really matters, isn't it? It's all very well to know what people on the street are saying, but what matters is what I believe in my heart. That is the question that Jesus put to his disciples. And you can see there in verse 20, Peter's answer. God's Messiah. If you're a Christian already, and if you're familiar with this passage, well, the answer seems obvious. Of course, Jesus is the Messiah. I mean, after all, that's what his last name means, isn't it? Christ means Messiah or anointed one. So it's easy for us. But think what it was like for the disciples. They had never met a Messiah before. The Messiah is a one-off person. There was only ever going to be one Messiah in all of history. Jesus' Jewish disciples knew of the Messiah from the scriptures because the prophets had said that God would send his Messiah his anointed one, who would re-establish the throne of David and usher in God's new creation. But they'd never seen a Messiah in the flesh before. I mean, how could they have? There was only ever going to be one. So it couldn't have been easy for the disciples to grasp that, that this man, who, who was their friend, Jesus, that, that he was not just another example of something they'd had before, a prophet, but, but no, that instead Jesus was the ultimate one-off, the Messiah, the one, the one to re-establish David's throne and bring in God's new creation. And uh, in a sense, it's not easy for us either. I, I mean, to, to most of us here, it won't be news that Jesus is the Messiah. It won't be news that Jesus is the one-off saviour, but... Don't we sometimes treat Jesus as just another prophet? Uh, don't we sometimes treat him as just another teacher, as someone who has helpful things to say rather than treating him as the Messiah? What difference would it make to your life to live out the news that Jesus is God's Messiah? Jesus himself, in the next part of the passage, will show us what sort of a difference that should make. Because as Messiah, Jesus earns and he demands our total allegiance. Many people have been surprised and perplexed by verse 21. That's the place where Jesus warned his disciples, as soon as they've said, you're the Messiah, he says, don't tell this to anyone. Uh, it's... it's Surprising, isn't it? You'd think that Jesus would want people to know. But, but I think the reason why he wants to keep it private for this time is exactly what we've been talking about. Precisely because there's never been a Messiah before, there's no mould for Jesus to fit. And so the world is not going to understand what it's actually going to mean for Jesus to be the Messiah. He explains it there in verse 22. He's to be rejected by the Jewish leaders and put to death. And after three days, he's to rise from the dead, something which the, the disciples just couldn't understand. You see, if, if even the disciples don't understand what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah, how possibly could the world understand? And so it's best 
if Jesus takes some time to instruct his disciples privately about what it really means for him to be the Messiah before they go public with the news. Who would have guessed that the Messiah would have to die? Now in this section here, Jesus doesn't explain at all why he would need to die. He doesn't go into that. He simply states that he will die. Now if you've been a Christian for some time, you will know that Jesus died for our sins. To bear the wrath of God. So that we could escape the wrath of God. Jesus is the only one who could pay that debt on our behalf. Certainly none of the prophets could have done it. And you will know that Jesus volunteered to die in this way because he loves you. So when Jesus said the things that are recorded next for us in verses 23 and following of Luke chapter 9, where he demands our total allegiance, well, these are not the words of a prophet or a teacher or even a revolutionary. These are words which only make sense on the lips of the Messiah. Verse 23, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. It's an exceedingly strong demand, isn't it? To deny myself, that is to, to give up ruling my life myself and hand the reins over to Jesus. To take up my cross, which gives us the image of a person who has been sentenced to crucifixion, carrying their cross to the place where they're to be executed. It is an image of a condemned person. Jesus calls his disciples to a life of being a condemned person. Now it sounds grim, but let's not forget that Jesus himself was condemned by the leaders of his day. They put him to death. And he warns us that his disciples should expect the same thing. Now, we've been fortunate in our society for centuries that people haven't been put to death for following Jesus. But we know that it's, it's been happening during all of those centuries in other parts of the world. And the environment for Christians, even in our society, is getting more difficult these days, isn't it? Not that we should want to be martyrs, but... Jesus says here quite clearly, look, if you want to be my disciple, you have to be willing to bear some of the embarrassment, some of the shame, even the condemnation that was meted out to Jesus himself. The key words in each of these verses, in, in 23 and 24, are the words which make it all about Jesus. It's the word, so in verse 23, it says, take up your cross daily and follow me, so it's not taking up your cross for no purpose. We take up our cross to follow Jesus. And then it's the same thing again in verse 24. Whoever loses their life for me will save it. So it's not losing your life for no purpose, but losing your life for Jesus. They're strong words, aren't they? But don't, don't they make perfect sense? I mean, isn't it worth it? Countless people have lost their lives for much less than for the Messiah. It, it, it makes perfect sense that if that is what is called for, to lose our life for the Messiah, for the one off Saviour, the greatest person who has ever lived, the one, the only one who could do this, who could lay down his life for us. And of course, Jesus goes on in the next two verses, 25 and 26, to make it crystal clear that there is a coming age, an age which is to be ushered in by Jesus' return in glory. Uh, we, we talk about it every week in the Creed, don't we? We say that Jesus will return in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. And we affirm that we believe in the life of the world to come. That is what Jesus is teaching about 
here in these verses. You could gain the whole world, something which I suppose Mr Elon Musk is closest to achieving right at the moment. But if you forfeit your soul in the world to come, well, it won't have been worth it, will it, even to have gained this whole world? That is what... Uh, excuse me. Uh, in the world to come, what will count is if you were a disciple of Jesus. Because as Jesus puts it there in verse 26, what, what we certainly do not want is to be among those of whom Jesus is ashamed when he comes in his glory. To be among those of whom Jesus says, I'm sorry, but I never knew you. Go away from me. So don't be ashamed of Jesus. When Jesus or his people are being bad-mouthed, stand closer to Jesus rather than further away. Speak up. Look, it doesn't have to be much. Uh, maybe if someone is criticising the church or, 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 or the teaching of the Bible, maybe all you need to say is to your friend, well, look, you know, I'm a Christian, actually. Uh, have you thought uh, maybe in criticising uh, Jesus or his teachings that maybe you don't have all the facts? Now, if we've said that, if, if, we've, if we've stood up in even that small way, well, then we haven't been ashamed of Jesus, have we? Next time you hear someone bad-mouthing the church, just think about Jesus appearing in glory with all of his angels. The Messiah demands our total allegiance, and he deserves it, and he has earned it. Why should he not expect us to deny ourselves for him when he laid down his life for us? I don't think that we need any more clarity here. It, it seems to me just so crystal clear that Jesus is not just another moral teacher, not just a prophet, not just another example of anything that we have had before, but that he is the one and only. But if we wanted any more evidence, well, we have it in the following verses from 28 on. They record what we call the transfiguration. This special glimpse which Jesus gave only to his three closest disciples, Peter, James and John, into his divine splendour. It took place uh, not long after the conversation we've spoken about. Uh, they were up on a mountain, uh, Peter, James and John, with Jesus. And at that time, Jesus' face changed, Luke tells us, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. That's verse 29. Jesus was speaking there with Moses and Elijah. It says the disciples were terrified. Now this was only a glimpse. It was just a glimpse of Jesus' heavenly glory. Just a glimpse of the shining beauty in which Jesus has lived with the Father and the Spirit forever and ever. The voice from heaven told them what must have already been clear, that Jesus is God's son in the very fullest sense. Even more than a Messiah, if that were possible. Well, we could definitely talk about the transfiguration in more detail another day, but today, today what I really wanted uh, to do was to, to empower us in telling the next generation about Jesus and and to do that I wanted simply to remind us of the unique message that we have Jesus Christ is not simply another example of what we've had before a prophet or a teacher he is the Messiah there is to be only one of him in all of history that understanding that fact is what motivated the people who told you the gospel they understood that Jesus is the Messiah and that even though he's from 2,000 years ago, you needed to know about him. That is why the news of what Jesus taught and what he has done needs to be passed on by us to the next generation. 
so that children yet unborn, as it says there in Psalm 78 verse 6, will arise and tell the deeds of God to their children. Now I hope to say even more about this uh, on Sunday, but let me just say for this moment that no matter where you're up to uh, with, with the, the, that part of the next generation that is closest to you, uh, whether you, you're, you've been blessed with children and perhaps grandchildren, uh, or, or whether you have not, maybe you've got godchildren or nieces and nephews who are particularly important to you if you're part of the, uh, the, the older generation, wherever you are up to with that next generation, it is not too late. It is not, I know that some of us are, uh, are very sad that, that some of our children uh, in our congregation are not following the Lord at the moment. I want to say wherever we are up to, it is not too late. It is not too late to pray. It's never too late for that. And it is not too late for us to go into the world so convinced that Jesus is the one and only that it is going to flow out of our lips in conversation with everyone that we meet. Isn't it a thrill to think that children yet to be born will teach their children about the words and the deeds of Jesus, God's Messiah? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you that you sent your Messiah into the world the one and only, the only one who could pay the price for our sin in dying his atoning death. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you did not spare your only son. And, and Father, please forgive us if we have ever treated Jesus as just another prophet, just another teacher. Help us, Father, to have a deep, deep conviction that he is the one and only, uh, the only Messiah, the only one who could save us. Father, please empower us to teach this saving fact to the coming generation. In Jesus' name. Amen.